Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In our continued series on History 102, we do the world of 1910, the age of men. So we start with Mary Poppins, because it is the perfect place to start. Now, in our class, we would show a video on our YouTube. We can't. Um, so... Oh, we're going to take a look at Mr. Banks's opening song about, well, life. And it tells us kind of everything about him. But it also tells us about the attitude of life in England for an upper middle class white guy in 1910. I feel a surge of deep satisfaction. Much as a king astride his noble steed. When I return from daily strife to hearth and wife, how pleasant is the life I lead. So life is good. I mean, he has deep satisfaction coming home from work. He's coming home from work. He's walk, walking home. I mean, when was the last time you felt that way? But he's also comparing himself to a king. Working at a bank is daily strife. Mrs. Banks. Uh, dear, it's about the children. Mr. Banks, yes, yes, yes. I run my home precisely on schedule. At 6.01, I march through my door. My slippers, sherry, and pipe are due at 6.02. Consistent is the life I lead. It's grand to be an Englishman in 1910. Ah, he's going to philosophize. King Edward's on the throne. It's the age of men. I'm the lord of my castle, the sovereign the liege. I treat my subjects, servants, wives, children, with a firm but gentle hand, noblest of liege. It's 6.03, and the heirs to my dominion are scrubbed and tubbed and adequately fed. So I'll pat them on the head and send them off to bed. Oh, lordly is the life I lead. It is great to be a man in 1910. He's got a good job, a good income. He's got servants. He's got a loyal wife. He's got obedient children who he doesn't even have to parent. He spends one minute of the day with. He is like a medieval lord in the modern world. He compares himself several times to a, to a king, to a lord, to a sovereign. That his power as an upper middle class white man in London... Is lordly, noblest of liege. Everything works the way it's supposed to work. At 6.01, he walks to his door. He has slippers, sherry, and pipe at 6.02. Well, someone gets them for him. So he's got a great life. A job he likes. A family he doesn't have to deal with. Problems he doesn't really have. There's money to be made. Things are stable. Mr. Banks is conservative. He's going to be a conservative. He's not going to want things to change. So. The next song is a British nanny. Having found out that his nanny has left, he has decided to write to the most conservative paper, the London Times, to put out an advert for a real British nanny. Why does it have to be a real British nanny? Well, a British nanny must be a general. The future empire lies within her hands. So, all right, a nanny is a woman who is doing the raising, right? The future empire is in her hands, not his, not the male breadwinner, the nanny. And so the person that we need to mold the breed, that's a nice way of referring to your kids, <laughs> is a nanny who can give commands. A British bank is run with precision. A British home requires nothing less. 
tradition, discipline, and rules must be the tools, and without them, and these are going to be important words for conservatives, disorder, catastrophe, anarchy, in short, we have a ghastly mess. Conservatives hate those words, disorder, catastrophe, anarchy. It's in the psychological makeup. They want stability, calm, predictability. And so what we're getting is Mr. Banks wants his children to be drilled like soldiers because life is war. But Drilled in tradition, discipline, and rules to avoid disorder, catastrophe, and anarchy. So what he needs is a British nanny to use conservatism, tradition, discipline, and rules to avoid the fallout, the chaos of liberalism, disorder, catastrophe, anarchy. You know, those words are the French Revolution. Meanwhile, what did the kids want? So we can compare nannies. The kids write their little advertisement too. And they write, wanted a nanny for two adorable children, to which Mr. Banks scoffs. If you want this choice position, have a cheery disposition. Rosy cheeks, no warts. Play games, all sort. You must be kind, you must be witty. Very sweet and very pretty. Take us on outings, give us treats. Sing songs. Bring sweets. Never be cross or cruel. Never give us castor oil or gruel, i.e. punishments. Love us as a son and daughter and never smell of barley water. So don't be a drunkard. We're going to talk about that when we get to the 20s. Don't be drinking. But love us as a son and daughter. Like, Mr. Banks wants his nanny to be a general. He flat out says that. The kids want their nanny to be a parent. And not a grandparent. A parent. You go, well, why not a grandparent? Well, they don't want any, notice they don't want any of the ages. It's a little ageist, right? Rosy cheeks, no warts. Very sweet and fairly pretty. You know, never be cross or cruel. And so you can see that the children who are going to inherit the 1920s, right? This is 1910. So the children in the 1920s will be in their 20s and 30s, right? Are, want loving parents, want an emotional connection. They're looking, they've given up on their parents. So they want a nanny who can step in as a parent. And that's kind of where Mary Poppins comes in. There's also Gilbert and Sullivan's famous song, Modern Major General, which is in 1879 and is the fastest singing song on Broadway pretty much until Hamilton's Guns and Ships. And this is a song in 1879. So it's, it's great because it's 30 years before World War I, but it's making fun of how stale the military has gotten, how old the military has gotten since the Napoleonic War. Remember, Mr. Banks talks about a British nanny must be a general. Well, let's look at the type of general. He's got an image of a general. Let's look at what the general's really were in 1879. In 
in 1910. Because there hadn't been a worldwide, European-wide war fought since Napoleon. So by that point, the war skills had gone stale. And there are a lot of words. But we're going to concentrate on the last two stanzas. And the point of this is, the point of the first one, two, three, four pieces is that he's a smart guy. The modern major general has many cheery facts about the square of the Yahya Pachanus. He's got information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. He knows the kings of England and the quote to fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo and order categorical. He knows his stuff. He's got math. He knows his animals. He knows his, his history, mythic history, King Arthur to Sir Caradoc. He knows his classics. He could tell his Raphaels. He knows the croaking chorus of the frogs of Aristophanes. He's not dumb. He's not an idiot. He's very well educated. He's hyper educated. But he's not educated in war. Or at least modern war. And that's where we come in with our yellow box. In stanza five. In fact, when I know what is meant by Mamelon and Ravelin, when I can tell the sight of a Mauser rifle from a javelin, when such affairs as sorties, which is to attack out of a defensive position, uh, is going to be very important in World War I, Sorties and surprises are more wary at. And when I know precisely what is meant by commissariat. When I have learned what progress has been made in modern gunnery. When I know more of tactics than a novice in a nunnery. So he's flat out telling you he knows nothing about modern warfare. In short, you'll say there's I've got a smattering of elemental strategy. Ah. You'll say a better major general has never sat a G. For my military knowledge, though unplucky and adventurous, again, this is going to play out in World War I, has only been brought down to the beginning of the century. But still, in matters, vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. So Gilbert and Sullivan writing in 1879 about the very model of a modern major general has them as old, hyper-educated, and completely out of touch with what's going on in warfare. And these are the kinds of guys that are going to lead the militaries into World War I. Literally guys. Gilbert and Sullivan didn't know what they were predicting 40 years later, but they predicted it. Old men, unversed in modern warfare and tactics, were going to send their soldiers, young men, into the slaughter. So this brings us to conservatism. Things are great. Why change? And when I talk about conservatism, I am talking Edmund Burke-style conservatism, not modern conservatism. Not Mitch McConnell, not Donald Trump, George W. Bush, conservatism. Because that's not conservatism, and we'll talk about why in a moment. But Edmund Burke basically invented modernity with the invention of conservatism. See, before Edmund Burke, there wasn't a philosophy of it. It just was. It was, you didn't like to change because life is good. But Edmund Burke was a British politician reacting to the French Revolution. And number one, he's not a revanchist. He's not a reactionary. Conservatism is not looking back to recreate something lost. That's what reactionary is. It's not make America great again. That's not conservatism. That's not conservative. That's reactionary. 
It should be a good conservative. Edmund Burke would say, make, keep America great. So I guess that was um, Donald Trump's kind of maybe uh, campaign for re-election was keep America great. That's conservative. Not looking back. And here's the thing. We talk about America as having a Republican conservative party. It's not conservative. It's reactionary. It's really revanchist. We really don't have a good word in America for going back because there's America is so much progress. We're not that old. We're only 275 years old. So there's not much to look back to. Like, if you really want to go back to tri-corner hats, I mean, you can. You could go to Philly and go to the Independence Hall and buy your tri-corner hat and your, your wool jacket, soldier jacket, you know, if you British red coat if you want. But most people are like, no, I don't want to go back. But the modern conservative party, the modern Republican party is revanchist. It is reactionary. It doesn't like 2020, 2021. It is Donald Trump's make America great again. That's what people voted for. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm just saying what it is. Make America Great Again was Don, was uh, Ronald Reagan's campaign in 1980. So this is not new. And the idea is, well, Ronald Reagan talked about America as a city on the hill. He's referring back to the pilgrims, because that's how they referred to Boston. And what would heaven would be like. So... What that means is, and what the modern political conservative party you're dealing with, you're not dealing with conservatism, you're dealing with revanchism. They want to go back to some great age that probably didn't exist. Uh, boomers want to go back really to the 1950s. They want to go back to their childhood. They want to go back before they had, when they could have fun, when the world was good, when money was was expensive when you know a quarter could buy you a lot of shit um when they didn't have responsibilities when they weren't about to die because now boomers are in their 60s and 70s and when life didn't have problems for donald trump i think he wants to go back to 1980s i don't think he wants to go back to 1950s i think he's in 1980s revanchist because that's when he was at his most famous that's when he was at his most powerful that's when he was at his richest you know he was building big buildings in manhattan he had finally broken in he was on the cover of the daily news and the new york post he had a football team he had an airline none of it was run well but that wasn't the point he was on page six of the post. He was famous. He was famous for being Donald Trump. And what was important was taxes had gone down. Regulations had gone down. Like, look at what he got passed. You know, a tax cut and less regulations. The 1980s. And Make America Great Again goes back to the 1980s. So you're dealing with so if, if you want to be a conservative, this is here to help you understand what you want to be. But if you are a Republican wanting to go back to a glorious time, that's not conservative. That's revanchist. You want to change things. You want to reverse things. Um, evangelicals who want to get rid of Roe versus Wade. That's revanchist. They want to go back to 1968 before Roe versus Wade was legal. And before pretty much birth control was legal. So it's a it's a wanting to to roll back the time, to stop and roll back the changes of liberalism. That's not Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was a British politician who thought the world is as good as it is. It's fine. Tradition and customary institutions are good. Change if necessary, 
should be slow, prudent, and based on experience. He did not want to go back. He wanted to go forward. He just didn't want to break anything by going forward too fast. He thought the American colonies had a right to protest. He's like, they have a right. The, the king and the parliament are not treating them correctly. He thought French peasants should have a right to demand the vote. But in both cases, he was against the revolution. And in short, wrote a book called Against the Revolution in France. And the French peasants cut the king's head off, which horrified him. So he wanted change. He believes in change, but not upheaval, not chaos, not disorder, not anarchy. He believed in hierarchy. That hierarchy was natural. There are better men. That men are in charge of women. Just as there are lions that are king of the jungle, there are kings that are heads of men. But that doesn't mean he believed in dictatorship either. He believed every rung of that chain, in the Middle Ages there was a concept called the chain of being, had responsibilities. It was a very Confucian concept to the one below it. So the master had responsibilities to the apprentice. The master was in charge. The master got to tell the apprentice what to do. But in exchange, the master gave knowledge, gave protection, gave um, access to their network. He believed in agrarian and a rural life. He believed that the farmers were pure people. He thought the city was corrupt. In some ways, this is Jeffersonian uh, democracy. But this is also Sarah Palin in 20, 20, 2008. When she went to, on a campaign in North Carolina, she went to rural North Carolina, kind of like a, uh, a rally, a Trump rally, to a, she went to a rural place in North Carolina and all the people there were white and she got up and she said, I'm so glad to see real Americans in real America. Well, why is a southern rural farm real America and why are southern white people real Americans? This idea of an agrarian rural life being pure, that the cities are corrupt. And you'll see this fight. This fight is in um, one of the cabinet debates in Hamilton, where Jefferson talks about the farmers, the farmers, the farmers, the farmers. And all you Wall Street want to do is steal from people. All your city folk are fast talking you know, thieves. There's patriotism, but mixed with localism. You love your country, but local areas rule themselves. Local towns. So in some ways, it's very Rousseau. There is not a national structure. Like there's a king, but the king doesn't tell people what to do at the local level. The king runs the nation, but individuals run their lives. And so it's against disorder and chaos and anarchy, which is all about Hobbes, right? Uh, Hobbes is all, hates all these things too. And it worries that quick changes will have lots of unintended consequences. Edmund Burke is Hobbes without the violence. And 1900 was the height of this, the height of the European order. Industrialization and imperialism. Europe controls the world politically. 85% of the world directly controlled. Europe controls the world economically, with wealth increasing even for the poor. God was clearly on our side. It's a religious age. It's a very Christian religious time. The world is predictable. Queen Victoria has been on the throne in 1897 for 60 years. Most people living in 1900 had never known a different queen. 
Science was good. Paris, Pierre, and Marie Curie won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903. We have the World's Fair of 1851, which is the Crystal Palace down there on our bottom left. This massive, war, giant building of glass. Like, where are the walls? And then there's the World's Fair of 1889 that built the Eiffel Tower, which you people still want to go and see or go to the top of. Conservatism wins. Life is good. Change, industrialization, and change have kept the order. There's still hierarchy. There's still kings. There are still better peoples who are born wealthy, who are still getting better jobs. But, 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 there's Mrs. Banks. It's always the wife. Conservatism is being challenged and under siege. And you see this in, in Mary Poppins. Women are changing. They demand for voting rights equity in the public sphere, not equality. They're not, follow, not, not demanding equality to be treated just like men. They want equity. They want the same power as men. They want the same access as men, but they don't want to be treated as men. Emil Pankhurst is leading, is the leading uh, far left with her window smashing campaign. She brought hammers, took them out of her petticoats and smashed business windows. Hunger strikes. Her argument was the argument of the broken pane of glass is the most valuable argument in modern politics. The idea, and conservatives hate this because it's, they view it as chaos, is you must be a problem to get noticed. This is the George Floyd protests. Tens of thousands of people went to the streets, marching. I'm a liberal. I thought, that's great. They're exercising their constitutional right. They're demanding change. They're marching on the White House. They're marching on Broadway in New York. My conservative friends thought it was chaos. They thought it was anarchy. And they were fixated with the few examples of looting. Obsessed with it. Now, the 10,000 people marching in Philly didn't loot anything. They did shut down. They did shut down the highway. And that was considered chaos. Well, you can't drive anywhere. They're shutting down trade. You can't move. You can't get across the bridge. But that's what em Emmeline Pankhurst, that's what Mrs. Pankhurst says, is you have to be a problem. Otherwise, you don't get noticed. All of the people who would have written letters about George Floyd, oh, please be less racist, America, who would have cared? Like, I noticed, because I'm liberal, but my friend also noticed, because he's conservative. We had different reactions to it. But that's the difference between liberal and conservative. And we see this in Winifred Banks' song, Sister Suffragette. From Kensington to Billingsgate, one hears a restless cry. Every corner of the land, womankind arise. Political equality and equal rights with men take heart from Mrs. Pankhurst has been clapped in irons again. No more the meek and mild subservience we. Now, she's singing this with her servants. We must fight for our rights militantly. Never you fear. So cast off the shackles of yesterday. Shoulder to shoulder into the fray. Our daughters, daughters will adore us. Our granddaughters will adore us. And they'll sing a grateful chorus 
Well done, well done, well done, Sister Suffragette. She's fighting for her rights militantly. Now notice all the military stuff going on in Mary Poppins, right? The, the husband feels like he's a king. He's a lord of his castle, right? A British nanny has to be a general. And women are fighting militantly for their rights. Mrs. Pankhurst has been clasped in irons. She has been arrested again. So they're causing problems. And if you're Mr. Banks, in fact, there's the funny scene that they put all this stuff away. Like, oh, you know what Mr. Banks thinks of all this. Well, Mr. Banks is a conservative. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want women to vote. He doesn't think women are equal. He doesn't want the change. Because what if you double the electorate? If suddenly all women can vote, what does that do to politics? It's no longer predictable. But also, let's bring this up, right? Is Mrs. Banks really united with her servants? Like, there's the picture of her singing with them. And, you know, we could say, oh, all women should have equal rights. But how does she feel about who those servants would vote for? They're not going to vote for the conservative party. They're not going to vote for lower taxes on the rich. They're going to vote for change. So conservatism is being challenged and it's under siege. Women are changing and demanding and fighting and causing problems. No longer, as she says, the meek and mild subservience we. We're fighting for our rights militantly. That's the broken pane of glass. There's also science. Science is a danger. It's bringing change. It's bringing new knowledge, new technology. It's undermining the old ideas. Cities are now rising. The elevator has made 10, 20, 30, 50 story buildings possible. That never happened before. But in 1930s, we're reaching 100 stories. Is man supposed to be that far up? To look down on life, to be so separate from what's going on on the street? Really? Notice Paris. There's the Eiffel Tower, but everything else is four stories tall. Nothing is bigger than four stories. In, in Philly, you're not supposed to have a building taller than uh, Ben Franklin. He ain't that tall. If you ever go down to City Hall, he ain't that tall. But skyscrapers are rising. And what's going into those skyscrapers? What ideas? What new inventions? Oh, science doesn't need God anymore, right? Darwin shows how life evolves, right? Physics is showing the birth of the universe with the Big Bang Theory. Science increasingly, people look to science that can explicitly, explicitly explain, explain everything. And so you're starting to get atheists for the first time. Life is good enough that you don't need God. And so people are stopping going to church. People are saying, well, maybe there isn't a God, which is agnostic. And you have people who are flat out atheists. They're like, there is no God. It's science. What you think of as God is just science. It's just physics. Now that's going to freak out Mr. Banks. Because if there is no God, then what is there? If everyone's in it for the science, well, science is immoral. It's amoral. It, science is just science. There's also the idea that men are failing. And Mr. Banks totally feels this way. There are no wars. There's money. There's decadence. This is dandy consumer metrosexual culture. Men were soft, vaguely homosexual, not gay. Gay hasn't been really invented yet. So they're still kind of homosexual. You know, they have sex with other men and it's a perversion. It's a, it's a medical problem being a homosexual. The Oscar Wilde trial 
1895. He's sentenced to two years of hard labor for having a gay affair with a younger man. For corrupting the youth, something that happened to Socrates. Socrates was for knowledge, not for having sex with young men. But that doesn't mean that Socrates did not have sex with young men. But it's the same charge, the corruption of youth. Female gay sex, just for those of you who want to know, was not considered sex. And so it was not illegal. And so sex was about power. Sex was about dominance. Sex is about, for lack of a better word, penetration. And so since there's no penetration in female gay sex, it was literally not considered sex. It was like, oh, that's interesting. But it wasn't illegal. But there was the idea that the old, the world was old. It was tired. This is Robert Brooks's piece. Now, God, we'll talk about that in a second. Let me go into Robert Brooks's piece in a moment. But my favorite is from my college years, which is Fight Club. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Like, that's 1990, whatever, when the movie's 97, right? Comes out the same year as American Beauty which will win the Oscar for Best Picture, which is about the same thing, about being decadent. It's just decadent in the suburbs. But Fight Club is, might as well be 1910. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Or Brad Pitt's speech in the middle of the movie. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose, no place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our Great Depression is our lives. We've been raised by television to believe that one day we'll all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. That's 1910 as well. How do you know? Look at Robert Brooks's piece. Now God be thanked who has matched us with this hour, with his hour, that's God, and caught our youth and awakened us from sleeping, right? We're the middle children of history. We have no place. We're depressed, right? And now Robert Brooks is saying the same thing. We're asleep. He didn't have the language of psychology when he's writing this. With hand made sure, clear eyed and sharpening power to turn as swimmers into cleanness, leaping, glad from a world grown old and cold and weary, leave the sick hearts that honor could not move and half men and their dirty songs and dreary and all the little emptinesses of love, meaning sex without love, like it didn't mean anything. Oh, We who have known shame, we have found release there. Where there's no ill, no grief, but sleep has mending. Nought caught, nought broken save his body, lost but breath. Nothing to shake the laughing heart's long peace there, but only agony, and that has ending. And the worst friend and enemy is but death. So he's talking about how peace is death. Peace is killing you. Peace is money and it's dirty songs and it's dreary and it's emptiness of of going around to parties and trying to get nooky and it just sucks. There's no point. There's no great war. There's no great depression. There's nothing to fight against. There's nothing to strive against. It's decadence. So there's this feeling that conservatism is under siege by women, that the men are failing, the men aren't able to stand to maintain it. They want change. And that there's this thing, science, that is changing everything underneath. So that brings us to World War I, which was welcomed 
as a chance to be a man. Robert Brooks loved World War I. He would die. I believe he dies of blood poisoning on his way to go get murdered in Turkey, go fight on the Ottoman front and be killed there, given the casualty rates. If he didn't die on the boat, he'd probably have died when he hit the, hit the beaches. But it was the idea that you could prove one's worth. A chance to get all of this national tension resolved. Oh, the French and the Germans and the Russians and the British have all been err with each other. We'll talk about that when we get into World War One. But there's this like build up, build up, build up that like the war was released. It's oh, finally we could get this over with. You could finally have it out. And it's a great adventure. Which will be over quickly. Before the leaves fall or by Christmas. The idea was it will be one battle. The, it will be over. And then you could go back to your lives. Well, that wasn't World War I. And so we're going to end here. And we're going to have part two. We're going to do World War I and its consequences in our next episode. Thank you.